Are there really enemies within the church? Some of the people that Collins and his friends never talked about when they were discussing loving the least of these through the pandemic, they never talked about the small business owners who were forced to close their doors due to lockdowns and mandates. They never talked about the children who fell behind in schooling because they were kept home or the developmental hurdles that they now face because they wore masks for a year. There was a lot of people that the NAE also never talked about in their report on climate change. They didn't talk about the Dutch farmers who were forced to give up their livelihoods because of government regulations that were coming down from global bodies. Welcome to Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell, Radio for the Remnant, brought to you by Olive Tree Ministries. Today, Jan talks with author Megan Basham about a leftist agenda that has entered the church. Have some evangelicals really traded the truth for this social agenda? And doesn't the Bible say we're to consider the least of these in society? Here is today's program. Trevor, you've looked at the evidence concerning the Southern Baptist Convention. What are your thoughts? If you look at it from a left-wing point of view, the Southern Baptists were one of the last bastions of true Christianity in America and very socially and politically conservative. Right. So if you could conquer the Southern Baptists and move them to the left, you could move the whole politics of the South and, and, and America to the left. It would be a major conquest. Mm -hmm. So if you look at it in a purely secular way, this was a battle fought by the left to conquer and take over the Southern Baptists like they've taken over universities, like they've taken over Hollywood. It was just another institution on their list. Welcome to the program. So glad you can join me today. And if you've been a listener to Understanding the Times Radio for many years, you will know that in the early days, I began reporting on the infiltration of evangelical Christianity, and I still do. And I featured on air the film, and by the way, even in a conference, the film Enemies Within the Church several times. And I deal with aberrant apologetics, as you know. In other words, I'm trying to expose false doctrine, false teaching, and things that are going haywire in the church. And then I began hearing from Olive Tree supporters probably as long ago as 2005 concerning the church dilemmas, the unsound doctrine, the leftist agenda, etc. So here is just a short list that I could say would now be front and center in today's evangelical pulpit. And we'll discuss some of these here in the ensuing hour. There would be creation care, critical race theory slash social justice, welcoming the stranger and the push for immigration, tolerance, LGBT, a whole lot more. In 2020, along came the George Floyd ordeal, which happened less than 30 minutes from this recording studio I am in which would thrust social justice and critical race theory to the forefront of many churches. The biggest game changer of all of these would be how churches were used in the pandemic starting in spring of 2020. Also heard about 2012 about the Evangelical Immigration Table. This was an organization funded again by George Soros and dedicated to welcoming the stranger, as I just said. Well, my ministry is now carrying Megan Basham's rather new book, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda, 320 pages documenting a lot and naming the names of many that I'm familiar with, and you are likely familiar with, my audience, who at the very least are too friendly with this leftist agenda. In the book, Megan Documents, and I mean Documents with pages of footnotes how progressive leftist power brokers, such as George Soros, but others as well, have set out to change the church. That little opening clip you heard was Trevor Loudon from Enemies Within the Church. And I think to better introduce Megan for the balance of the hour, I want to play a soundbite of Megan. And in this clip, she's going to talk about probably a topic not everyone in my audience can identify with green Christianity, etc. But I think everyone will be able to identify with what happened to their church when the pandemic hit four plus years ago. So this tactic of spiritual manipulation to convince 
rank and file Christians to get on board with a variety of progressive agenda items isn't something new, but we certainly saw it very prominently during the pandemic. In particular, it was something that former National Institutes of Health director Francis Collins, who I'm sure many people are already familiar with, uh, he spent a lot of time drawing on his relationships with evangelical leaders and institutions to convince churches, pastors, everyday Christians to conform to the government's COVID narrative. So in that case, of course, they argued that loving your neighbor meant things like wearing masks, shutting down churches, getting an experimental genetic vaccine. And the point was that if you resisted these things, you weren't just disagreeing on a scientific level, you weren't just disagreeing on a political point, you were rebelling spiritually. And that was something that we saw very prominent pastors like Rick Warren of Saddleback Church argue on behalf of the government and Francis Collins. Warren exhorted Christians in one particular interview with Collins, wearing a mask is the great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. We also saw New York pastor Tim Keller, another very influential and very prominent figure in evangelical circles. He described churches that continue to meet in defiance of lockdown orders as the bad and ugly of good, bad and ugly church responses to COVID lockdowns. Maybe even a little more pointed, Ed Stetzer, who is the director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College, he had some very pointed chastising for anyone who questioned things like whether the virus could have escaped from a Chinese lab in Wuhan. He said that they needed to repent for spreading conspiracy theories. And I'm just gonna quote this one. Consider taking Christian off their social media profiles so the rest of us don't have to share in the embarrassment. Some of the people that Collins and his friends never talked about when they were discussing loving the least of these through the pandemic, they never talked about the small business owners who were forced to close their doors due to lockdowns and mandates. They never talked about the children who fell behind in schooling because they were kept home or the developmental hurdles that they now face because they wore masks for a year. There was a lot of people that the NAE also never talked about in their report on climate change. They didn't talk about the Dutch farmers who were forced to give up their livelihoods because of government regulations that were coming down from global bodies. They didn't talk about the people of Sri Lanka who were protesting food and power shortages caused by the green policies that their government had enacted at the behest of these global elites. Are these people our neighbors too? Do we need to think about how we're loving them when we consider embracing these policy prescriptions? We should be skeptical of those who are so quick to theologize those kind of policy judgments, especially when they have such evident human costs. Megan Basham, welcome to the program for the first time. Thank you for having me, Jan. I'm very grateful to be here. Where to begin? That's my biggest dilemma, because there's so much you talk about. And as I just mentioned in my intro, in just as recently as 2020, two things, the pandemic, of course, George Floyd, and both of these have so influenced the church. And you have a chapter, how the government used pastors to spread the COVID-19 propaganda. And I've just let you talk here for three minutes and 40 seconds in that clip I played. But can you expound a little bit more? What we saw during that time, and I think like so many people, that was a moment where some of the misgivings and discomfort we have had, so many of us who are in the pews, ordinary Christians, COVID was the moment where we realized that what was happening was not something that was just in our minds, that we realized, no, we have a significant issue here. And part of it was the legalism that was coming from church leaders who platformed former NIH director yes. Francis Collins, insisting that being obedient to Christ meant that you had to take a particular position on 
getting the COVID vaccine or wearing cloth masks or shutting down your church. And I think we need to remember just how legalistic this was. Francis Collins, his organization, BioLogos, put out a statement called Love Your Neighbor, Get the Shot. So obviously what they were saying is that to love your neighbor, you must get the shot. And you saw all kinds of Christian luminaries who signed that many Christian college presidents, many ministry leaders signed it. Along with that, they also required the signers to promise to discourage people from listening to non-consensus voices. Because we have to remember, there were scientists like Jay Bhattacharya, Martin Koldorf, who were themselves Ivy League educated, very serious scientists who were taking a different position. And this particular document encouraged Christians to not listen to these non-consensus voices. And then on top of that, what you had was Francis Collins spreading what we now know were falsehoods about where the virus originated from. One example is he went on a live stream on Christianity Today, and he said that this virus did not come from a lab, that nature made it. We later learned, of course, that that was not true and that Francis Collins and his subordinate, Anthony Fauci, knew at the time that it could very well not be true, even as they were insisting publicly that it was. And then on top of that, you had so many of these Christian leaders emphasizing Francis Collins' record as a faithful Christian brother. Yes, That too was something that absolutely should have been cross-examined at the time. And as a journalist, that was probably the moment where I knew we had a very serious problem on our hands because I knew a lot about Francis Collins's record. I knew that he had pushed to protect scientific research and experimentation on aborted baby parts, that he pressed the Trump administration to continue funding that kind of research. I knew that he had declared himself an LGBTQ ally. I knew that he had spearheaded an initiative for the NIH that included experimentation on children in giving them cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers, mastectomies, all in the name of that LGBTQ, particularly transgender agenda. So there were a lot of things that should have been alarming about Francis Collins. And some of the Christian leaders who platformed him did know his record, and yeah. yet they went ahead and presented him as this faithful Christian brother. Well, let me just bring in a few other names, and we'll get into a little more detail here. But you've got Russell Moore, Christianity Today magazine, which basically is a Democrat Party headquarters. Again, you reference Ed Stetzer, Tim Keller, Rick Warren. And I think you tried to talk to several of these people, correct? And they gave you the cold shoulder? Yeah, I tried to talk to all of them and some others, N.T. Wright, yeah. Andy Stanley, other people who I feature in the book. And a couple of them did respond, but no one was willing to go on record. No one was willing to answer questions. Here's the thing, because along with the injection issues, these people were, I think, pro-lockdown, masks, the closing of schools. Am I wrong there? No, that's correct. Now, every individual may have not picked up on all of those yeah. issues. You may have had an interview where Ed Stetzer was pro-locking down churches, but they might not have touched much on whether children should wear masks in schools. But the general tenor of all of these interviews was entirely friendly and aligned with whatever Francis Collins was presenting. Let's talk for a little bit here. Southern Baptist Convention, Ethics and Religious Liberty Convention. And again, Russell Moore headed that for a while. He does not at this time. Russell Moore is over at Christianity Today magazine. That would be the Southern Baptist Ethics and Religious Liberty. And you spend a lot of pages talking about Mr. Moore. And I think somebody asked you in an interview, if there's one person you could sit down with and have an extended conversation with, you would love it to be Russell Moore. Frankly, I would as well. But let's bring him into the picture just a little bit here. And I'll tell you the reason why I would love to interview yeah. him. Because Russell Moore is so regularly championed and lauded in the secular left press, like the New York Times, like the Atlantic, like the Washington Post, all of these outlets. And what they tend to do is he will make comments and statements. In particular, he was making them while he was the head of the ERLC against his, what you might call political opponents within the Southern Baptist Convention. And mm. he did this regularly. His statements would then be repeated as fact by many of these high-profile media outlets. For example, right now, Tim Alberta has a book out. He is a staff writer for Politico. He's worked for The Atlantic. 
And in it, he presents Russell Moore's claims as fact, and nobody asked him to substantiate them. So some examples I can give you is he claimed that he was being psychologically terrorized by the conservative leaders within the Southern Baptist Convention. What does that mean? You're talking about other businessmen are psychologically terrorizing you. And by the way, audio that his subordinates surreptitiously recorded of business meetings within the Southern Baptist Convention and then leaked, they showed nothing even remotely contentious. So it was very strange to understand where these allegations were coming from. The same thing with the issue of abuse in the Southern Baptist Convention. He accused the executive committee members of horribly mistreating women when they would come to them with claims of abuse. When actual records came out that included internal emails, documents, memos, they showed all of these committee members speaking very respectfully to women who claimed that they had been abused. And we're talking about adult women who, years after the fact, said, I, as an adult woman, was abused by another adult man. All of these things, again, became major media narratives, but they were never substantiated in any specific way. Same thing with Russell Moore saying that there were white supremacists and neo-Confederates sitting in Southern Baptist pews. That was repeated. It was printed. Nobody asked him for specifics. So that is the reason that I would love to really do mm -hmm. a proper cross-examination interview with Russell Moore to answer some tough questions. Mm -hmm. I want to expand this just a little bit, Megan, and I want to play a clip here, and it's going to include comments from the late Phil Haney. I remind my audience, I had lunch with Phil Haney two weeks before he was murdered in Southern California because he was on to things, folks. They said it was a suicide, and Phil told me at that luncheon, he said, man, if I turn up dead, they'll say it's a suicide, but it won't be. Russell Moore, who is, I think, the main person who is responsible for this, at least in the Southern Baptist Convention, Al Mohler brought him on maybe 20 years ago. I don't know the precise time, but he's been a, served as a professor. He served as a provost and the dean. So he had very responsible positions at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. And then he was in, in 2013, or maybe it was 2015, he took over from Richard Land as president of the ERLC. They have a budget of five or six million a year, and they have about 30 staff. And it's turned into a honestly, genuinely leftist social justice arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. It's like the Southern Baptist Convention has got this cancer, and it's very disturbing, very disconcerting. In 2015, the George Soros Foundation said this, Reverend Russell Moore, head of the public policy for the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, and then they quote Russell Moore as saying that evangelicals should be the ones calling the rest of the world to remember human dignity and the image of God, especially for those fleeing murderous Islamic radical jihadis. Now, so Russell Moore is forwarding immigrants from Muslim countries coming to the United States. There is a link to George Soros. Now, why would George Soros want to fund Russell Moore? And, and why would his organization be bragging that this is what Russell Moore said with our money? My name is Philip B. Haney, and I became a spirit-filled Christian November 7th, 1975. And that's really the basis of my worldview. What made me more of a public figure was being a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security, and I worked in Customs and Border Protection and I was a subject matter expert in the strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement. And I literally interviewed hundreds of individuals seeking entry into the country who had potential ties to terrorism. Tell me what you think about the ERLC under the leadership of Russell Moore getting involved with the United States State Department and encouraging them to build a mosque not only the United States State Department, but also the Justice Department. Ever since Loretta Lynch and my former boss, Janet Napolitano, they began forcing communities to violate their own zoning laws, but also paying the Muslim community damages for their bias, their racism, their Islamophobia. That started during the Obama administration. It makes Russell Moore and the ERLC an accessory to a spiritual and theological crime. A kind of an enablement. You're advocating on behalf of 
a theology, an ideology that's in direct contradiction to the one that you say you live by. That's a kind of a psychosis, isn't it? Who is the primary abuser of Christians all over the world today? The very religion, Islam, that this particular individual is trying to help build a mosque against the wishes of the entire community. I would like to know how in the world someone within the Southern Baptist Convention can support the defending of rights for Muslims to construct mosques in the United States when these people threaten our very way of existence as Christians and Americans. Sometimes we have to deal with questions that are really complicated and we have to spend a lot of time thinking them through and, and, and not sure exactly uh, what the final result was going to be. Sometimes we have really hard decisions to make. This isn't one of those things. What it means to be a Baptist is to support soul freedom for everybody. Russell Moore has taken money from, from this uh, individual. Russell Moore has also taken money uh, from the Democracy Fund. $50,000 went to the MLK 50 conference. Why would the Democracy Fund, an openly uh, leftist organization, want to fund an evangelical conference that gave Southern Baptist students at seminary credits to attend? Again, that was a clip from the DVD, Enemies Within the Church. You can find that in my online store, and I want to say a word, too, about the newest book that we're carrying, which is Megan Basham's book, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda. If you join me late, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell, and I have Megan on the line. Megan, give me your thoughts. Now, again, let's remind folks, Russell Moore, he's currently with Christianity Today, so he's got a new position, but give me your thoughts on these things and what you just heard. Yeah, that brought up a lot of other reasons that I yeah. would love to interview Russell Moore. And I'll say that I have tried multiple times, even once in person, after I had tried to go through his assistant a number of times, I just providentially once ran into him in an airport when we were both on the same flight right around the time that my Francis Collins story came out. And I said, Dr. Moore, could I have a moment to speak with you and ask you some of these questions since we haven't been able to connect? And he said, no, 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 you have to go through the official channels. And I don't know how else to put it other than he somewhat ran away from me mm -hmm. in the airport. But those sound bites bring up so many reasons that I would want to speak to him. I want to ask him about this funding, which is correct, that as the head of the ERLC, he started taking funding from the Democracy Fund, which for those who are not familiar with that foundation, it was founded by Pierre Omidyar, who was the founder of eBay. And he's a left-wing Buddhist. He is not somebody who has any interest in seeing Christianity mm -hmm. advance in the public square. And again, the purpose of the grant that he gave them was for what I would call part of this racial grievance industry and bringing it into the Southern Baptist Convention. On top of that, when you look at Russell Moore's involvement with the Evangelical Immigration Table that has been funded by Soros, that is under the umbrella of a secular left Soros-funded organization, the National Immigration Forum. And you look at the fact that someone like Russell Moore has been listed as a grantee in George Soros's own documents, in the documents of his Open Society Foundation. There should be so many questions about Russell Moore's influence in evangelicalism and how he has been ground zero for bringing in this progressive influence for years. Well, now one of the mouthpieces of the religious left today, of course, is Christianity Today magazine. And some listeners hear that and say, oh, come on, are you kidding? Billy Graham founded that in the maybe 1950s. So what possible damage can be done? And let's just talk about Christianity Today. My goodness, <laughs> talk about a leftist agenda coming across as innocent and all that, but a Democrat Party. Yes, it was already well on its way there yeah, before yeah. they brought in Russell Moore as editor-in-chief, but it wasn't surprising that they did so because they're clearly ideological fellow travelers. And one of the ways that I demonstrated that in the book was doing some research into the political donations of Christianity Today's staff. What I found was that between 2015 and 2022, they had about 74 political donations between their staff and their board members and their executive leadership, and all of it went to Democrats, every single dollar. And that included some very hard left Democrats. All of them were pro-abortion, pro-LGBTQ, but some of them included Elizabeth Warren, 
the news editor for Christianity Today as he was covering the 2020 election, was also donating to Elizabeth Warren's campaign. And we have to remember, Elizabeth Warren is so extreme, she has vowed to shut down every crisis pregnancy center across the country. These are the kind of people who are setting the editorial agenda at Christianity Today. I later talked to their CEO, Tim Dalrymple, and he objected that in 2023, one member of their staff did give to a general Republican group, but it turned out that was the person who works with donors. So I found that a little amusing that after the elections were over, he pointed to one and it was the front facing person who's responsible for explaining Christianity today to its readership. And I think when you look at the coverage they've been providing, it's pretty evident where they stand ideologically. They have done virtually no coverage whatsoever of the bills that are being passed in Republican states to prevent gender indoctrination in schools. They have done no coverage of the bans on transgender procedures on children. They don't cover that. Instead, what they have been covering is gun control legislation in a very positive and promotional way. They cover climate change legislation, again, in a positive and promotional way. So you can very much see how they're using their influence to move evangelicals to the left. About the same time, my reference was 2020 in some of my opening comments. And we all know that spring and summer of 2020, George Floyd tragedy took place again, about 20 minutes from where I'm sitting right now, Megan. And it seemed after that, I started to get email after email after letter and letter. Something has happened to my church. My church has gone left. My church only now wants to talk about white privilege, critical race theory, social justice. And mind you, many of these are gospel preaching churches. They're not traditionally religious left churches. I'm not going to get into denominations because there's very wonderful, solid churches in all these denominations as well. But give me your thoughts on this because it took off like a rocket into space. Part of what we saw was that when it started to come out of the 90s and the Promise Keepers movement, early 2000s, It had a positive purpose to overcome the vestiges of remaining racial division from the Jim Crow era. And I think we can all understand that. But at that point, what you saw was Marxists using that good and godly Christian empathy and Mm. desire to set things right for diabolical purposes. What they did was they brought in this critical race theory which creates a class of oppressor and oppressed. So if you take Marx's economic classes, the bourgeois, the lower classes, it replaces them with racial classes. So you have the white oppressors and the minority oppressed. In bringing that in, they were introducing Bible studies where churches were segregating their church members based on race, saying this particular Bible study is for our minority members Mm -hmm. so that they have a safe place to lament. So they were introducing division into the church. There were other Bible studies, including Be the Bridge. A lot of well-meaning churches brought that in. It required white church members to not speak for the first six months. They weren't allowed to argue. They weren't allowed to debate anything. They were just to listen and do the work of reading all of these critical race theory texts for six months. This was the kind of thing you were seeing. And rightfully so, a lot of people started to go, what's going on here in our churches? And I was one of those people. I can tell you that in 2020, when the George Floyd riots started happening, our family, we were then at a church where our children's ministry director sent out an email that provided links to curriculum on how we could talk to our kids about their white privilege. And that's really when I got heavily involved in writing about these issues. Interesting. As a mom of two young girls, I went, no, 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 no. I do not want to talk to them about their white privilege. And I disagree that they have white privilege. And this is something I have a major issue with. So as we talk about the Southern Baptist Convention too, the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S., it was a driving force for bringing this into evangelicalism broadly, because you saw the president at that time, J.D. Greer, who's also a megachurch pastor in Raleigh, he started using the language of critical race theory explicitly. I don't know if he knew this, but he was using terminology and a glossary that came straight from the Aspen Institute. Same glossary being used in secular academia all over the country, places like Harvard. So when we think about how extreme they have become, 
let's think about the fact that some of our church leadership was using the same documents they were using and shouldn't be surprised then to see the results in that Greer at that time announced that he was going to be implementing a DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion style racial quota system in making his committee appointments. He said that his appointees were going to be two thirds minorities or women because we needed their special wisdom. So all of this is incredibly unbiblical. It's Marxist. Did they know it at the time? I don't think we can say that, but certainly they've been influenced by it. You just joined me. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio, Jan Markell. I began hearing about Megan Basham's new book, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda, a month or two ago. As I said in my opening comments, I was talking about a little bit of the content 15 and 20 years ago, as I noticed so many things in the church moving left. I didn't fully have an explanation or an understanding of it. I just knew things I once knew as very sound were beginning to cave and crumble. About that time, one of the topics that caught my attention would have been the Green Christianity Movement. And I want to talk about that for just a minute or two. And I'm going to introduce that by playing a little clip of Megan. One of the important points she's going to make is that evangelicals are between 25 and 30 percent of the electorate. Therefore, all sorts of movements are trying to get the attention of the evangelical Christian. So creation care is used in this, not just environmentalist movement, but specifically climate change movement to say that Christians, and you have actually seen this from um, some of these speakers at seminaries and things like that, saying that in order to be faithful to the gospel, you have to engage in creation care, which they then explains means being a climate change activist, lobbying for um, policies like cap and trade and the kind of fossil fuel regulations that make your gas more expensive and your groceries more expensive. And so that is really what you saw in the climate change movement within Christianity. And probably in that chapter, it was the one where I went back the furthest. Um, I kind of went back all the way to the early 2000s because that is when this really developed. And it was my opening chapter after the introduction because it presented such a roadmap of how all of these kind of progressive issues have taken hold in the church in the sense that you had these um, ecumenical groups that were not just Christians. Sometimes they involved uh, left-leaning Christians like the sojourners type um, of people, but also Jewish groups, Catholic groups, all the progressive mainline groups. And they would join together to say, evangelicals are really a problem in terms of getting this particular policy across the finish line. So how do we engage evangelicals on this issue? Because for those who may not be aware, evangelicals represent something like 25 to 30% of the American electorate, and they overwhelmingly vote conservative on almost all of these issues. So there was a real effort made. Um, So a a left-leaning ecumenical foundation created a front group in the uh, Evangelical Environmental Network. And it got funding from all sorts of left-wing secular foundations like the Tides Foundation, the Clinton Foundation, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, lots of others. And essentially what it did was it created this organization and brought in leadership from places like Christianity Today, the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. And the goal, as they say in their own literature, was to harness the influence of well-known evangelical leaders in the hopes that uh, their views would then trickle down to the people in the pews, the rank and file. And over the years, you have continued to see those efforts made. Now, they have not been as successful as they wanted. So I would say in recent years, it's actually shifted to instead of hoping to move evangelicals through top-down influence, they have pursued what they call a grass tops uh, campaign in which They're trying to get seminary students, people on Christian college uh, campuses to uh, speak up to their church leaders now and say, we want you to take up the issue of climate change. And to that end, they are getting their speakers in seminaries and on Christian campuses. And so all of this is not a move to say things like, let's reform our personal conduct in regard to the environment, say something like recycling. But in fact, to turn people into political activists on the issue. 
I have in front of me a little write-up, and I got this off the website of the National Association of Evangelicals, and I'm staying in the vein of what you've just heard in that clip. That was Megan Basham speaking in that clip. It's talking about their publication, Loving the Least of These, Addressing a Changing Environment. And they say this, Record-breaking heat waves, widespread fires, and other extreme weather events capture our attention. While the environment affects us all, the most profound impacts are on those in poverty. Loving the least of these, addressing a changing environment, is an updated report showing how climate change impacts the world's most vulnerable. One more paragraph. They write, as evangelicals, we believe that caring for creation is part of our calling as stewards of God's creation. We also believe that caring for the most vulnerable is central to the way of Jesus. Loving the least of these explores the biblical basis for Christian engagement, the science of climate change, how climate change affects the poor, and practical ways to move forward. We hope this report will equip the church with a greater understanding and resolve to care for creation and love the most vulnerable around the world. Folks, I began seeing this some 20 years ago. My first question was, what does this have to do with the gospel in that evangelicals are now on board? And by the way, if I could slip in parenthetically, I care about the creation. Every one of my listeners cares about the creation. We just simply haven't made it a pulpit issue as evangelicals now want to do. Megan, your comment on this, please. To piggyback on your I care about the creation, so do I. So do I believe all Christians. And I also believe that caring for the creation does not mean that you must agree that climate change is an existential problem that has been caused by human activity. And that is what the little trick is there. So they're implying that to care about creation, you must agree that humans are causing significant damaging climate change and that we need to have redistributive policies, um, Western nations to address it. One of the things that I found was so interesting in one of these left-wing progressive, left-wing funded groups that have been brought in to speak at seminaries like Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Raleigh, which is a very large school, educates pastors of all Protestant denominations, was that he said, America bears a lion's share of guilt for the problem of climate change. And therefore, we should have policies imposed on us in order to address it that developing nations, other non-Western nations wouldn't necessarily have to have. And that's so interesting because is that not also part of that Marxist program? So we see how that's been brought in through this issue. Look, I have said repeatedly I disagree that climate change is a significant problem. I don't believe humans are having much impact on the weather, but I also believe Christians could, in good faith, have different views on that. My issue is that they have been making this a legalistic test of your faithfulness to the gospel. That was something that was explicitly said at Southeastern Seminary. And so they're bringing in these speakers who are associated with the Obama administration, with the World Economic Forum, to speak to these seminary students, to press this message that to be a faithful Christian, you must promote cap and trade, carbon emission limits, and all of these other things. And that is why it became the issue that was the opening chapter of my book, just because when you went back and you looked at their documentation, if we want to talk about George Soros, a think tank that George Soros funded, New America, also funded by Bill Gates, by the way, it talked in very explicit terms about how they wanted to get access to evangelicals in order to push climate change policy. And what they called it was the rent an evangelical model, by which they meant that they wanted to convince some high-profile evangelical leaders to take up the cause. When you look at how they very shrewdly understood that this was the way to come in the side door and get evangelicals to push policies that would be against their interest, and let's say harmful to their neighbors in many ways. In that clip, I mentioned an increase in price of gas and groceries, but also harmful to people in the developing world. And that's something that you rarely hear that in some of these nations like Sri Lanka, like Ghana, these climate change policies have been incredibly destructive to the local people there as they're developing their energy infrastructure. And you have the World Bank and the UN coming in 
preventing them from making use of fossil fuels to improve their lives. And the question that we have to ask is what you just asked, Jan, why has this become an issue in which pastors and ministry leaders are involving themselves and speaking about from the pulpit? Because I think it's very hard to look in scripture and say there is a clear delineation of what God expects us to do in regards to this issue. Very well put, Megan. This so puzzled me. As a matter of fact, in, I believe, the 1990s, at best it could have been maybe early 2000s, a very prominent evangelical local pastor, I could name him, everyone would know who it is, had a, I think it was a Saturday seminar in a local church, how pastors could save 10% on their electricity bill. Again, this isn't your first United Methodist Church. It's a prominent evangelical pastor telling pastors how to save on their electric bill. And that's when I knew something was very, very haywire. And, you know, I have documented the way the mainline Protestant church has declined almost into insignificance over the last 100 years for making the same mistake that we're spending an hour talking about today, Megan. The evangelical church prospered in the last 60 to 100 years because the Methodists and the Lutherans, not all of them, of course, have gone so far into the social gospel that the gospel was being left out of the pulpit completely for some of these other kinds of social issues. And the National Association of Evangelicals came along, I believe, in the early 1940s to counter all of this. That's why it breaks my heart to see them now drifting so far left. And I don't mean just one organization. You spend 320 pages talking about individuals and organizations that are making the same mistake. That represents not just thousands of people, but millions of people. Absolutely. The one bit of encouragement I can say is that it was heartening to me to go back through the history and see that people like Francis Schaeffer recognized yeah. this in the early days and spoke out about how evangelicals needed to be very much on their guard from embracing this Marxist utopian thinking that would turn the church into a social activism club. He warned against it then. Today, it has obviously reached some epidemic proportions. But what has been cheering to me is to see how many evangelicals out there, how many ordinary, everyday, working Christian moms and dads recognize the issue and are now speaking up about it. One of the things you and I chatted about off air was that I did have very much a recognition that other people like you, like others, had been sounding the alarm for a long time. And I felt like I was arriving to the subject rather late. But part of what has been providential and has been a blessing of COVID is that it allowed so many of us to have the scales fall from our eyes as far as how bad the problem was. Because I think so many things happened in that condensed period of time that it became something that we could no longer ignore. And we recognized we have a serious problem of this worldly, unbiblical, leftist incursion into our churches and our ministries. Mm -hmm. Who is funding this leftist agenda? We've already referenced good old George Soros. Now, I believe his son has taken over. Rockefeller Foundation, Bill Gates. Who are we missing here? I'd love to give you just a really specific current example of something that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping to do some reporting on it in the next couple of weeks. I've written on them before, but if you look at something like the after party, so if you're not familiar with it, it is a political Bible study that was created by three never Trumpers, David French of the New York Times, again, Russell Moore, Christianity Today editor in chief, and Duke Divinity professor Curtis Chang, who is best known for his promotion of the COVID vaccine by saying that it was a little like Christ's redemption. It's very strange theology there, but they created this political Bible study. It claims to be nonpartisan, but obviously when you look at the three people who created it, we don't have a wide variety of political views there. And then on top of that, when you read and watch their material, the purpose of the Bible study is very subtle, but it comes across pretty clear if you're paying attention. For example, you will see David French saying that Christians cannot know how they should vote on issues like abortion, but it spends an entire episode saying that Christians are obligated to vote to address systemic racial injustice. So it seems very clear what side of the political aisle they're promoting. And this political Bible study, which is being brought into conservative churches, 
onto conservative Christian college campuses. It has been promoted by the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, which of course represents some 85 member schools, including schools like Biola, Mm -hmm. Baylor. Well, this Bible study was funded exclusively by hard left secular funders, Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, which also promotes things like transgender procedures on children, abortion, and also the Hewlett Foundation, which is the second largest private funder of Planned Parenthood in the country. So these are the people who are promoting this. And when they announced that they were going to be making a grant to fund this curriculum, they noted it was going to be rolling out in an election year in the battleground state of Ohio. So if we want to talk about who is politicizing the church, these are the people who I would argue are doing that, and they're doing it right now with secular left money, and they are bringing this Bible study into pulpits. In fact, Curtis Chang told pastors, if you don't want the obligation of having to deal with politics in an election year, just bring our curriculum in and let us take the hits for you. So really encouraging pastors to abdicate their responsibility to shepherd their sheep. You can learn so much, folks. This 320-page book, Shepherds for Sale by Megan. And then we have the DVD, Enemies Within the Church, also in my online store. I encourage you to check out both of them if that's possible. Megan, Vody Balkum says this, and he's written a testimonial for your book. He says, those exposed within its pages of your book must give an account. I think we know that's not going to happen. That leaves people like me really, really frustrated. Has anybody on the left reached out to you and maybe said, give me some time, or you've taken this all wrong? Are they reaching out to defend themselves? Are they doing anything other than running for the hills? Well, obviously, there has been some pushback, probably most prominently from J.D. Greer. He wrote a long, open response to Megan Basham and her book, Shepherds for Sale, I think is what he titled it. I wrote a long response back to him. And when I looked at what J.D. Greer wrote, what it seemed to me was that he was trying to deny that his record is what it is. For example, he said, I didn't implement racial quotas, except that he did announce that he was going to be making committee appointments based on people's skin color and gender. He said, it's going to be two thirds minorities and women. So I don't know what you call that other than a quota when you say, here's the number and you have to meet these external qualifications in order to qualify for an appointment. That's a racial quota. I don't Mm -hmm. know what else to call it. And so I have seen some of that. And again, if you want to go look at it, I have nothing to hide. I would encourage you go read J.D. Greer's response to me, but then please also read my response back to his response. But largely that has been it. I've seen a lot of trying to rely on disclaimer comments. For example, I spend some time on Tim Keller's record is very much disparaging Christian Trump voters. My purpose was not to be political, was not to take a side for Trump or against Trump. It was simply to say, this is how these prominent pastors treated Christians who did vote for this candidate. When I did that in the book, I had a lot of Keller defenders come out and say, but Keller distinctly says, I'm not a never Trumper. He said before he passed away that he was not a never Trumper, which that's fine, except that he did write articles for The New Yorker that were titled, Can Evangelicalism Survive Donald Trump? He did give an interview to Premier Christianity in the UK in which he did say, Donald Trump is making it harder for Christians to evangelize. And he did go to a private meeting of high profile evangelical leaders that was dedicated to the question of how do we manage evangelicals reputation in light of the election of Donald Trump? So he can say that he was not a never Trumper. And yet his record, his own comments do speak for themselves. So I have likened it to this. And this is not to put these, by the way, in the same moral category, but just to give an analogy. And that's if you have a friend who is routinely making disparaging comments about minorities and making offensive jokes of that nature, but who then says, but I'm not being racist. You understand that the words that came before that disclaimer undercut it Hmm. and they don't erase what he said before. And I would say the same thing about so many of these pastors and leaders, their comments and their records cannot be erased by a quick disclaimer. 
And so much of what I document in the book, you can look it up for yourself. You can yes. cross check it. And I've done some writing since then that I would say you can look at it and you can see their records and see whether or not that is what they said. You can write Megan Basham at The Daily Wire, dailywire.com. I want to throw in one very short soundbite because it's the trailer for Enemies Within the Church, and I play it because it so complements everything that Megan has written. And again, I have Enemies Within the Church also in my store. I don't say this to make a lot of sales, folks. I don't care about that. I care about content, and I care that my audience be properly informed. What happened to the church? to the living, powerful, transformative, nation-shaking Christianity. What they're trying to do is completely demolish Western civilization and then to rebuild it in a just society. How do you break down American Christianity? I think the problem today in our culture is many of our words have been co-opted and stolen and dumbed down and reversed. Social justice is sold as something that it isn't. Critical race theory is sold as something that it isn't. Whiteness has caused blindness of heart. Whiteness has caused blindness of heart. When you preach victimization, it always leads to vengeance and vice. Us against them, me against you, I want my pound of flesh. American churches today are where the universities were 10 years ago. Pretty heavily Marxist. They're not quite there yet, but they're well on the way. Many of the seminaries and Bible colleges are definitely already there. That message that they're going out and taking the world is not, you need to repent of your sin, receive Christ. Instead, the message that you actually have is they are under the weight of racism or sexism or homophobia, and then we need to unify them together. I'm gay, I'm 29, I'm a youth pastor in New Jersey. I'm straight, and I'm also a youth pastor in New Jersey. We're planning on sharing life together for the rest of our lives, which we're not totally sure what that looks like. Obviously, Nick is straight, and he does plan on getting married. Uh, when he has a wife one day, she'll make those decisions with us. The future damage of what we're doing now is just going to be enormous. The entire fabric of family, personal wealth, private property, all those things are out the door. And everything is the state. They believe the state is God. They don't define justice the same way as the scripture. Oh, no. It's going to be an equality, all right. And it's going to be a totalitarian Marxist justice. Again, that's a little trailer from Enemies Within the Church. And I think the point of this hour, folks, is, as you just heard, the message of repent because the king is coming again and you need to know where you're spending eternity has been replaced by emphasis on creation care, critical race theory, social justice, welcoming the stranger, tolerance, LGBT. Again, the items that we've thrown in here, some of the pandemic issues. Megan, I'm down to about two minutes. You want to sum it up? It's all yours. Thank you. And I just want to say really quickly, I'm yeah. glad that you were using sound bites from enemies within the church, because when I came over to the Daily Wire, one of my first assignments was that someone sent me a documentary pitch and I took a look at it and I did a review and I covered it in positive terms. And I will tell you very early on, before I was really aware of a lot of the issues that were going on, suddenly my inbox was flooded with institutional leaders chiding me for covering that film really? in a positive way. In fact, it set me on the path to writing about it myself. So I, you didn't even have this book in mind when you saw Enemies? No, I didn't have that book in mind at all. It was very early on when I came over to the Daily Wire and started picking up on some of these issues. Since then, I've gotten to know the filmmakers behind it and yep. enjoy their work very much. But I look back on that and I think that was Providence. I had just gone to a media company that would let me write about some of these issues with boldness. And God just put me in a position where I was able to connect with some of these people and get information to start working on this book. But I didn't know it at the time. So I think they are really good companion pieces. And what we need to recognize is that a lot of this has been allowed to not only fester in the church, these infiltrators have not only been allowed in, because of the leadership 
that we have that has been either overtly selling out for Soros money or Bill Gates money, but also some of the softer selling in terms of influence and reputational peddling where they want to be positively recognized by the New York Times or the Washington Post. And when I look at that, what I want to say to people is the command to contend for the faith once delivered to all the saints is not just given to leaders. This is on us too. We have a responsibility to see to the health of our churches and ministries. And part of the way that we have to do that sometimes is to emulate the Apostle Paul in confronting the Apostle Peter. And it's not to say that these are all false teachers or we're not judging the state of their souls, but some uncomfortable conversations have needed to happen for a long time. And I also think that each and every one of us who are Christians, who are involved in our local churches and ministries, we have to take responsibility for that too. And respectfully and kindly, but also firmly start to initiate some of these conversations. Megan Basham, thank you for all that you do. Check out this book, Shepherds for Sale. It's a classic, that's all I can say, folks. And I am so out of time. I'm just gonna go out with the Bible verse because it's one of my very favorite verses. It's so appropriate in unstable times, be it instability in the world or the church, And that would be Isaiah 33, 6. And God will be the stability of our times, a storehouse of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. I can't add anything to that, but be assured, nothing is out of control because God is always in control. I want to thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. Contact us through our website, olivetreeviews.org. That's olivetreeviews.org. Call us Central Time at 763-559-4444. That's 763-559-4444. We get our mail when you write to Olive Tree Ministries and Jan Markell, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. That's box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. All gifts are tax deductible. We are God's representatives in a world that has an expiration date. We are here to represent the truth and spread the truth, for God is not the author of confusion. We are on borrowed time as we watch all things fall into place.